Thank you. My name is Edna Adden, and I'm a midwife. And because I'm a midwife, I've come to talk to you about the health of women and children. My country, Somaliland, is a country with one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. A country that has known civil war, 82 to 91, during which a quarter of a million of our people were lost and 95% of our cities destroyed. This, of course, is, was a situation that needed two things, either to turn away and say, I don't care, I don't feel, I don't know, I will just disappear into the horizon and go and settle somewhere in one of your great countries, or stand firm and try to do something about it. 60% of our people are nomads. I know how difficult it is to provide health care to people who are sedentary. But when they're nomads, it makes it even more difficult. When they're poor, when the country is so wide, it makes it very difficult. There are also situations that arise because any facility that existed before the war were destroyed. Many of the bones you see on the screen could have been the bones and the remains of health workers. When you've had a past and you were born with a proverbial silver spoon in your mouth, the only thing I could do was to try and stand firm and give back to the people what the world had given to me. This was why when I retired in, 1960, uh, in 1997, at the age of 60, from the World Health Organization, I went home and I tried to put to practice what I had been preaching during all my career as a World Health Organization uh, civil servant. The site upon which the hospital was built was one that was once a graveyard, a military parade ground, an execution ground, and eventually a garbage dump. In an area of Hargeisa, the city, the capital city of Somaliland, where no hospital had ever been built before that time. The hospital took four years to build. It was four years in a country where labor and skilled construction people were very few. But we labored on and Eventually, the hospital was born in 2002. That hospital today is one where almost 12,000 children have been delivered. That child you see in my arms was the first baby that was born in that hospital about 10 hours after the hospital was opened. Among the 12,000 most of them were people who had been referred to us or women who had found something wrong with, with, them, with their pregnancy because women who think they are having a normal pregnancy have their babies at home. So the 12,000 children that we delivered in the hospital were mainly delivered because they were sent to us because of a complication either with the pregnancy or the mother or whatever. We remained a maternity hospital for a little more than a day or two. Because in your countries, you have the luxury of having specialized hospitals. You have something wrong with your eye, you go to the ophthalmologist. You break an arm, you go to the orthopedic surgeon. But in Africa, in my country, you're sick, you just go to a hospital. So it was not possible for us to say, we are a maternity hospital go and get your heart attack treated somewhere else, go and get your diabetic coma seen to somewhere else. It's a hospital, it's a hospital. Men are treated, women are treated, children, whatever. We also have a facility where we can do surgical interventions. Since the 1st of January this year, we have operated over 500 cases only 185 of them were cesarean sections. The others 
contractures, cleft lips, obstetrical fistula, thyroids, and on that site that was once a garbage dump, we can also operate on children who have hydrocephalus. So we can even do, not brain surgery, but we tamper, we touch the brain of children. And we have done over 27 cases, and thank God, all but one have succeeded. And the one who died, died of diarrhea and vomiting two weeks after the operation. So, the story is, where there's a will, there's always a way. We are also a teaching hospital, because it's not the bricks, the mortar, it's not the instruments and the facility that's going to look after sick people. It's the skills, it's the knowledge, it's the competence, it's the efficiency of the people who work in these facilities. And unless you have doctors and nurses and midwives who know what they're doing, who care with compassion, who care and respect the dignity of the human beings, you cannot do anything. We have trained over 200 nurses. We have trained over 150 midwives. And my passion is to multiply those girls you see with the red capes, multiply them by a thousand. And why do I say that? Because it is these young women who were trained for just two years who go back to the districts and the region we recruited them from who make a difference. Somaliland has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. But among the 12,000 children and women we have delivered, we have been blessed to be able to reduce our maternal mortality rate to a quarter of the national average. Not because we have a magic wand, but because we have an emergency preparedness we can deal with a hemorrhage as soon as the woman comes in. We have an operating theater that works 24 hours a day. It is midwives who make the difference. Doctors, yes, we need doctors, but they take eight or nine years to train, and for goodness sakes, where am I gonna get doctors from to work in Somaliland, a country which is on the dark side of the moon? Yes, we need graduate nurses and midwives, but we don't have them. And we don't have the four years and the five years it takes to train a midwife. So what we do is we rely on the two-year trained midwives. They are a quick fix. They're cost-effective. They're efficient. They're dedicated. And they do not get stolen to work in other health facilities because they're trained as midwives. They remain in midwifery. And unless Africa and countries like mine multiply the training of these midwives, we will continue to lose women to causes that you have protected your women from dying. We will protect them from eclampsia. We will protect them from infection. We will protect them from uterine rupture. No woman dies in your countries of uterine rupture. She would not be allowed to go into labor because somebody would already see that she has a contracted pelvis, or there is a disproportion between the size of the baby and the size of her pelvis. No woman would die in your country of infection. You have water, you have soap, you have equipment that is sterile and that has been prepared to be used safely. But our women die of these causes. Our women die of causes that no woman in this day and age, when man has reached the moon, no woman should die of but we don't have the skills, we don't have the facilities. In our countries, one in ten, women have one in ten chances of dying of a pregnancy-related cause. In your countries, it's one in 4,000. Your women are treated by doctors and midwives throughout their pregnancy. Only 10% of our women have access to a health facility. And that is why we must have more midwives who can go to the regions, who can go to the districts, who can be where women are to help them, 
to screen them, to identify the ones who are having a normal pregnancy and possibly expected to have a normal outcome, or to refer these women to where they can be helped better. My hope, my ambition, is that one day we will have a thousand of these. And why not in our countries? If Somaliland can do it, anybody can do it. If Somaliland, with its limited resources, with its past of civil, civil war and destruction, can reduce its maternal mortality rate to a quarter of the national average because of the training of midwives, why not other countries? Why not in Papua New Guinea? Why not in Ethiopia? Why not in Eritrea? Why not in neighboring Somalia? Why not in Lesotho and all of these countries that have a very high maternal mortality rate? If it can be done in Somaliland, it can be done anywhere. My message, my message is to governments. My message is to governments to allocate more funds instead of spending money on tanks and guns and bazookas and, I don't know, military hardware, spend more money on health, on education, on infrastructure, on water, on sanitation. So that is one education. The second is educate women, educate girls. When you educate a woman, she is able to take care of myself. I cannot imagine where I would have been if I had not had access to the education and the training that has helped me to help others. And of course, educate the community. Unless the community has the confidence to utilize whatever health facilities are available, we will continue to lose the battle. One of the things that has really made a difference in my appreciation of human tenacity and the strength of women in developing countries is when I see women who come into our training who are so timid, who are so dependent on others, go through a transformation that gives them the confidence to think, to answer, to advise, to guide, and to help other women. Education is one of the strongest gifts we can give to a human being, and particularly to a woman in Africa. My last parting suggestion is don't ever underestimate the capacity of a human being who is determined to do something. If I, at 60, 14 years ago, could build a hospital, anybody, any of you can do it. I thank you all for your attention, and thank you for this opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you.